In this video, we'll be concerned with Doblin's 10 types of innovation. Innovation is a long-term permanent change in a product or in some production process. And there are various videos on the course that we've put forward that argue this case, that, that suggest that it is a long-term permanent change in the product. The product is innovated, we say. It's changed and it's changed permanently. It's not a temporary change. It's changed permanently to meet perhaps changing market conditions or changes in uh, uh, consumers' expectations or wants. But it's also possibly a change in the production system itself or a change in the business. So innovation, as we'll see later in, in later slides on in this uh, session, it, it runs right throughout the business. So innovation is a long-term permanent change in the product or in the way in which the business is conducted. It's forced on businesses because of technological change and the need to remain competitive. Generally speaking, innovation tends to come from the outside. It tends to be that within the environment within which businesses work, there is technological change, there's innovations. And this could be due to uh, rapid uh, electronic or uh, computer or some sort of change in, in the environment that is forced on the business if it's to remain competitive. Otherwise, its competitors will adopt these changes and uh, the company itself will be left behind in the marketplace and will lose market share and eventually go out of business. Some changes have to be admitted are based on the perceptions of the owner, changes about the way the organisation is set out and may not be technological, they may be related to the production system or the owner of the business thinks that uh, if he or she moves the production system from one area to the other and reorganises the stores or reorganises the marketing department, uh, that will lead to competitive advantage. And that is also innovation. But a lot of innovation, and this is the, the point we're trying to make here, a lot of innovation comes from outside. It's forced on the business through technological change. But it may, it may be derived from internal factors. It applies to all aspects of the business, from the product development and changes uh, to changes in the administration of the business. So it, it runs right throughout the organisation. The idea of innovation being specific to the development of a particular product is not correct. It is, as I said earlier, uh, related to the design of the business, the layout of the business. Um, it's also the way in which the product is produced. Uh, perhaps it's innovation in terms of the way it's marketed. So it's, it runs across all the functional areas of the business. Dublin introduced his 10 types of uh, innovation framework during the late 90s. So it's not a, a, a long, been around for a, that long compared to many of the theories of innovation, particularly here when you think of Schumpeter. But Dublin identified innovation as a holistic approach within an organisation uh, consisting of all functions, processes and innovations. Um, consisting of, not of. So he identified a, a holistic approach. He, he identified the organisation in total, looked at all of the functions of the business and looked at all the processes and all the operations. So it looks at the whole issue of the business and then tries to work out how innovation can be identified and applied within that business. So his framework is to divide the business into three categories consisting of 10 innovation types. And that's where we get the title for this session, 
we're going to look at the 10 innovation types that uh, is proposed. Now the three categories, well, these are configuration, offering, and experience. And we'll see what we mean by these in a second. But for the moment, these are the three broad categories. Now under configuration, we have the, the company's internal systems, uh, the functions of the, the core foundation, uh, um, the functions and the core foundation. So the configuration is, is what is the business? What does the business do precisely? How is the business set up? How is the, the business configured? Uh, how is it designed? How is it laid out? Fundamental question about the business. Where is it located? Um, how does it manage to produce its product or its service? And um, how, is it, how is it laid out? How is it structured? Then we have offerings and experiences, and these are also related to what is meant by these terms. So under offerings, we have the company's products and services. That's what it's offering. It's offering to the market, it's, it's products and its services. So we have the offerings of the business. And we have the experience, uh, focused on the end user and their experience of the product and the service. So the experience is, what do the customers think of the product or the service. So we have three categories, configuration, offering and experience, and that's essentially what's meant by the three of them. Now under these, we have subdivisions. We have, uh, under configuration, for example, we have the profit model. How is it, uh, how is the business configured in terms of the way it goes about generating profit? Uh, looking at its efficiency, looking at its production process, looking at its networks, its structure, how it's how it goes about its its day-to-day -day tasks. And what's it trying to achieve with its profits? Is it uh, trying to maximize its profits in some way or is it trying to generate enough profit to be to be happy and contented? What exactly is the orientation of the business in terms of profitability? What's it trying to do? What's it trying to achieve? So once we we know that we've got some sort of picture of the business, we know how its systems are set out, how it's configured. We also know what its motivations are in terms of the profit model, looking at its networks, how it's uh, where it sits in the marketplace, how it's links to other companies and suppliers. Uh, looks at the structure of the business itself, the way it's designed, um, the company uh, limited li liability, who's involved in the business, looks at the processes. So it's a, a total picture of the business. Under offerings, we have the product performance and the product range. This is what the, the business is offering in the marketplace. It's offering products and services and it looks at the performance of those products. What do the products do? And how reliable are the products? And what's the reputation of the product? What's the perception of the product in the mind of the consumers or the buyers? And looks at the, the total product range. What is it the business is producing? Is it producing one product or is it producing lots of products with variations? So again, it's giving us a picture of the business, looking at the offerings of the business. And then under experience, we've got the, the service of the business. It looks at um, how the business provides its services to both the consumers, the, the, the buyers, but provides its services internally to the workforce and to the various stakeholders who are associated with the business. What's the experience of, of this business in, turn, in their eyes? What's the experience of the business? Is it perceived as a, a good business? Is it perceived as an innovative business, uh, a compassionate business, a nice business, an efficient business? How exactly is it viewed? And also, 
looking at the channels it uses how does it sell its product what are its marketing channels and that also will give us a picture of the business um, if it sells its uh, products in very expensive outlets or if it's uh, known for its quality products and it sells the products on to other companies perhaps but its experience the experience of the business is qualitative it's, it's good quality looking at the brand looking at how the business has developed and what brand it's created and of course there is customer engagement how are customers uh, communicated how, how, how are they dealt with how are they brought into the picture um, so it's it's how we experience the business and uh, we can experience it in various ways like in the offerings how we we see the products of the business and the configuration what is the business itself so there are different pictures we can take of the business from different perspectives and we can take the pictures under these various perspectives and if we count the um, these number we've got 10 10 types of innovation we've got four under configuration two under offering and four under experience and that's really what we're going to to deal with now let's talk for a bit about configuration well it's an important and crucial element for innovation the organization um, must survive through financial means it's pointless to business attempting to be innovative if it's not producing sufficient resources to survive so the business must be profitable for it to engage in innovation it's a prerequisite if it doesn't have the resources to be innovative it can't be innovative so it must survive financially it must have sufficient resources flowing into the business for it to engage in innovation the organization must consider uh, innovative profit models which work for the business and ensure profit potential it's not just a question of being innovative for innovation's sake the innovation that's selected by the business should improve the performance of the business in the marketplace it should help the business produce a better product or a new product uh, give the customer more satisfaction lead to more efficiency in other words the innovation is targeted it's not just any innovation for the sake of it this is targeted innovation it's innovation that's uh, been implied because it is logical to do so it, it fits in with the nature of the business it's not just cosmetic it's not just for innovation's sake it is associated with the business to help the business uh, further itself in the marketplace what effective strategies can the business utilize to uh, ensure pricing of product and services cash value and does this reflect the company image presumably the business wants to engage in innovation to improve the product improve efficiency as we said earlier but this means that perhaps the product is better for the customer but it also means that perhaps costs have been reduced there's a more efficient way of produ uh, producing the item so as i said in in the previous point point number two the innovation that's purchased and that's engaged in must be targeted at delivering outcomes for the business as i said not just cosmetic not just for the sake of it this is to enhance the business and enhance the business model so we have the profit model and 
we have the um, network. Now, in terms of networking, well, networking is an important function for success. All businesses must network to build and grow their client base. So networking is something we normally consider uh, in the context of marketing, perhaps just simply simply marketing uh, nodes, contacting each other and, and facilitating marketing. And that is certainly important, but networking is more pervasive. Networking cuts right across the organization. It's important for the different functions within the business to obviously be networked. They must communicate and they must have a high standard of communication internally. But there must also be good external communication. Communication uh, between the business and the customers. And also uh, 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 contacts between the business and the suppliers. Suppliers of raw materials or of facilities that are bought in. So it's important to have efficient networks and the quality of the network and the number of the networks is also a feature of the business and there must always be um, an approach within the business to look at the networks to see if the networks can be improved because networking is essential it's how the business efficiently conducts itself in the marketplace Connecting with new partners allows for the development of innovation solutions uh, to new products and services. Um, sometimes, by simply having contacts with the wider market, the business is able to innovate, bring in new products because of feedback from the customers. Or sometimes, uh, through networking, they know what the competitors are doing and are able to anticipate competition and therefore uh, engage in innovation to try and thwart the impact of that development elsewhere. So networking is very important. It supplies information to the business, which enables the business to make timely and good decisions. A new concept called open innovation allows organizations to connect, learn from each other and utilize their resources and technology. So it may be the case that companies, although in competition, some of them are able to agree to share facilities, uh, even though they're competitors, or some of them may uh, share facilities with suppliers. Uh, to be able to share databases with suppliers so that uh, they're able to draw off the database or draw off the, uh, uh, the database in the context of orders placed to know what raw materials are needed they enter it on the database and it's flagged up immediately on the supplier it just leads to that extra dimension of efficiency again it's because there is a network and the network has been agreed between the supplier and the producer. But it could be, as I said just a few moments ago, it could be between various producers. Virgin adopts open innovation and successful networking through their open approach to partnerships and business development schemes. Um, Virgin have been open to ideas uh, in the market for a long time and entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs are able to take their ideas to, to Virgin and of course if Virgin decides to be involved and fund the uh, development that becomes part of the, the Virgin family and that means also the business is able to tap in to wider resources expertise, wider resources and support. So it's this type of open innovation. Then we've got structure. Structure includes 
all the company's assets and resources, tangible and intangible. This is what the structure of the business is. It, it simply is a picture of the physical resources of the business, the buildings, the raw materials, the machinery, the vehicles, uh, everything it's got. But it's also the intangible, uh, the goodwill of the business, the contacts that have been built up, the networks, as we just talked about. And all of this paints the picture of the business. This is what the business is. An organisation must structure their business in the best and innovative way that suits them. So it's not just simply a question of getting a picture of a business or an idea about a business and thinking that that is the image of the business or that is the representation of the business that will be held in perpetuity. That's not the case. Businesses are continuously modifying and innovating, continuously changing in response to changes elsewhere or changes in technology, as we said earlier. Organisations must be creative in the ways in which they organise human resources and the management of business units. It's important that the, the business particularly in, in terms of the, the profit model that it's following, that it makes sure that the employees are looked after and that welfare is, is uh, primal and, and central to what they're doing. Uh, it, it's important that the organisation also presents itself as a caring organisation and is genuinely caring, not just trying to promote um, an image of itself that it perhaps is, is not true. So it's important for the organisation to project itself. An organisation structure must be unique in order to prevent competitors from copying. Organisations do tend to be different, but uh, when, a, when an organisation is successful, in other words, it's generating high profitability, word does get around in the marketplace and it's clearly the case that other companies will want to copy they'll want to replicate or duplicate it depends on how many there are uh, the success of the business they'll want to figure out what the business is doing to be so successful what are what's the products what are how are they doing it and they will want to uh, try to match that because they want a share of the excess profits and those theories are well established in economic uh, competitive models. Google adopts a very innovative organizational structure which enables them to effectively utilize all the resources and assets. Um, Google is a very innovative uh, organization. Um, but by virtue of its size, it's also quite open. It has to be. Uh, it's difficult for an organization of that size to keep secrets. There are so many people involved. So Google is, is very innovative and it's, it's almost open about its innovation. So it's developing products, putting the products online and almost challenging other internet businesses to try and keep up. Now we've got process. Well, process involves an organization's ability to innovate their process capabilities compared to their competitors. So it's looking at the process, it's looking at, say, production. It's looking at the way in which the products are, or the services are developed the way in which uh, customer requirements are met. It's looking at what goes into the system and how innovative is that? How efficient is it? Henry Ford is a prime example of uh, process in innovation uh, when he adopted the assembly line. There was no assembly line before Henry Ford that is worth mentioning. But 
when he developed the assembly line and broke production down into small units, uh, that became quite innovative. In fact, that whole theory was well developed back into uh, back in history. Adam Smith in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations had talked about the production of pins and how um, hat pins in, in the Adam Smith case and how hat pins could be broken down into small tasks. What Henry Ford did was to apply it on a large scale to the production of cars. But again, it was a process innovation. Uh, no one had done that. It was, uh, it was new, certainly in the car industry. Although, as I said, the idea of the division of labor, as economists call it, was, had been well established and well known about uh, throughout history. Uh, popularized, as I said, by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, in his book. Process innovation includes uh, implementing supply chain and logistical processes. Uh, so it's looking at the whole supply chain and looking at the delivery of raw materials and even the dispatch at the other end to market, if it's a physical product that's been produced and looking at ways in which that can be innovated and can be done cheaper, more efficiently, and offering a better service and a more reliable service to the customers. Just in time, known as JIT, and inventory management plays a role in process innovation. They may not adopt a JIT system completely, for various reasons, which will be discussed in other videos. And they may also be careful about the, the management of their uh, inventory and how they, they work out their inventory. But having said that, they will constantly, constantly be looking at ways in which inventory and production and the development of the products are worked out to try and work out better ways in which these can be delivered. And they will certainly have in mind something like JIT and inventory management. Although it may not be full JIT, it may not be full just in time. But it may be um, moving in that direction, but not perhaps not aspiring to be a full JIT. Amazon's innovative supply chain and delivery systems, let's say Amazon Prime, has allowed them to achieve success. Uh, Amazon um, are very efficient in their inventory management system and their idea of JIT and the way in which products are dispatched to, and particularly um, to prime uh, users. And these are special users of the Amazon system, customers who Pay for, uh, pay for um, deliveries and services and get preferential treatment as a consequence. Uh, but they get a very good service, which again reflects the type of innovative approach that Amazon has brought to bear on online retailing, or what's sometimes known as e-tailing. Now let's look at offering. Well, the product performance concerns the value of the, the product or the service. So it's really looking at the, the, the value of the product or the service, which is a reflection of the performance of the product. How well does the product meet customers' expectations? What's the market? What are the number of sales? This involves special features and quality of the product offered to the customers. So companies tend to produce a product, the product becomes, let's say, successful, but they don't just leave it at that, they then immediately go about trying to further develop the product. And there's an ongoing process of innovation to constantly change the product, bring it up to date, to refine it into more accurately meet customers' expectations. 
The focus here is to build an innovative product or service which meets the customer's needs and achieves success in the competitive market. So the idea is to constantly change the product in line with customers' requirements, which the company determined from feedback, from networks, um, and in altering the product in this way will generate extra sales and extra demand. And that, of course, will further enhance the, the status of the business and its profitability. This type of innovation can be new products or uh, newer modules of existing products. So the feedback, when it comes back from the customers through networks, perhaps through the marketing channels, um, will indicate what type of products the customers want. It may be entirely new products, or it may be modifications to the existing one. So the company has got feedback on, on which way to move forward to more accurately satisfy the customer's requirements. Um, Apple executes effective innovation. Apple are constantly looking out with their products to try and find what they can add to the product or what changes they can bring about in the product to more precisely meet the customer's requirements and also factor in elements of surprise in their presentations of new products. So the customers are looking for something, Apple try to give that extra. So the extra part of the the product that they're now offering is the surprise element, uh, what some people have um, called the wow factor. So a product performance, product system. Well, product systems involve developing innovative approaches to sustain the existing product through offering extension, complementary products and services. So the product, sometimes there's a core product, which is the essential product that the business produces, but it may also produce complementary products, products that go with it. Um, so the customer can buy the, the core product, but will also perhaps want to buy the associated products because they fit together. Go back to the Apple example people buy an Apple iPhone, well the iPad fits with the iPhone and they fit through the online database, the iCloud. But there's compatibility with the the various apps that are used on the two systems. And when a, a customer becomes fluent in one the use of one of the apps on let's say the iPhone, they are also fluent with the use of the app on the iPad. A much bigger system, they're able to use it as a, perhaps a substitute for, for a laptop. So there are complementary products that go with the product sometimes. Companies can create other products and services which can be integrated into one product. Uh, that's often the case, that we have peripherals associated with products that plug in and give us a better experience by virtue of their existence. So sometimes the peripheral could be software that we, we plug in. We acquire an extra functionality in a product by getting specific, um, let's say, applications again. So if we go back to the iPad example, if we buy a new app that does a particular job that's an innovation. It's, uh, it means that the existing product, the iPad, has now been improved, improved by the addition of this app, because now the iPad can do something new, or rather, the app can do something. But it's, there's a complementarity between the two. The two are uh, supporting each other, giving the customer a better experience. The purpose 
To do this is to develop robust products which will further satisfy customer needs. And of course, in the case of Apple again, once the customers are familiar with their operating system, with, with their processes and how to use the various devices, customers will tend to be loyal. And that gives Apple quite a robust market presence. The example picked here is the um, Gillette. Venus uh, offers product systems such as complementary products, uh, for example, disposable blades for shaving, uh, refill razors, shaving gels. Um, they don't just offer the product, they look to see what else they can offer, which will be complementary products. Now, experience. Well, experience um, or service innovation refers to the quality of services provided to the customer. So that's what we mean by service innovation. It's the quality of the service provided to the customer. And it's making sure that that information is up to date, it's accurate, it's reliable, uh, can be acted upon. Now, has the, the service resulted in a positive experience for the customers? And that's really the crucial question. Uh, if the answer is no, then the, the business has a problem. But think about the, the service that the, the customers are buying. And although we may talk about this in terms of service innovation, we could actually consider it in terms of a physical product as well. Has the physical product resulted in a positive experience for the customer? If it has, the customer may come back and make further purchases. But if it hasn't, that customer may be alienated. But not just that one customer, the customer may have friends who will also turn against the product. The service must further enhance the value of the product offering. So whenever customers, sorry, whenever the companies make a change, it must enhance the product offering. That's the whole idea. It must improve the reputation of the business, the image of the business. It must improve their services, their products. That's the whole idea of the innovation. So if it doesn't do that, then it's a failure. Or at very best, they shouldn't engage in that type of innovation because it's destroying their market. So innovation should be improving the experiences that customers have of that product or service. This is an important aspect as a customer's experience will result in them making a purchase. So if the customers are happy with the way the business is going and in terms of the way it's innovating its product and making changes and, and so on, then the customers will want to purchase. But if they're not happy, they may turn against the product. They'll offer um, product systems such as aftercare service plans, uh, product support and maintenance. So when people buy an, a Dell computer, they buy a physical product, the computer, but they also buy, buy into the support that Dell offer. If the product is, is not working properly, the, the Dell support team will become involved or maybe, maybe asked to become involved. Um, so they, it's peace of mind. So the Dell team are trying to ensure that what they are selling is good quality and meets the expectations of the customer. The channel's uh, innovation uh, focuses on key methods used to connect with the customers. So channel innovation looks at how the customers can be connected with. Uh, it could be by representatives of the business going out and talking to customers. It could be through advertising on television or in the press. Uh, it could be trying to communicate the message through events. 
um, constantly the business will be looking for some ways in which the the channels uh, of contact with the customers can be innovated and improved because it's only through the feedback that these channels uh, afford the business that the business can make the changes that are required for long-term sustainability. What different distribution channels are open to the customers and the ease with which they can buy uh, what they want and when they want? So it's finding out what the customers want. That's, if you like, a, if you like it's a soft channel. It, it's looking for information. But it's also the, the channel in which the, the customers buy the product. And it's constantly, uh, there's an effort to try and uh, improve channels so customers can buy the product more easily. So, for example, it may be in the past, uh, the business sold its products to warehouses. And the warehouses sold on to retailers and the retailers sold to the customer. Um, but each one, each layer in, in that uh, scenario was expensive because each one had to make a markup. And perhaps nowadays the business is trying to sell directly online. Now that will be an innovation, a channel innovation. The more channels available for customers, the positive, the more positive their experience of the company. If customers are able to get the product easily, They'll have a good reputation, uh, a good image of the business. They will see the business as having a good reputation and trying to facilitate their requirements. Because it's easy to get the product. If they have to do a lot of work in order to get the product, they may be put off. They may look to a competitor or not even to buy that particular product at all. E-commerce is the most successful in offering a range of channels. For example, online shopping, physical stores, agents, wholesalers, etc. But uh, e-commerce can, can be a way of advertising the product and may tell the customers where the product is available, which shops the product is available in, or where they may get it, or they may it may be possible to buy it online, as I said earlier. They may be able to buy it off uh, Amazon. They may be able to place an order and receive the product through Amazon. Or they may be able to place an order with the company itself who operates an online store. Burberry. Well, the luxury fashion retailer uses social media and live streaming which allows customers to instantly order flows as soon as they have uh, been seen on the, on the catwalk. So it's a very innovative way of selling, but they really engage modern communications methods to try and uh, tap in to the, their customer base. The customers are able to see perhaps a, a fashion show and they're able to see it live online or are able to talk to a representative live online and make purchases. And that's a very innovative way of um, conducting business. The brand, well, the brand innovation refers to a company's brand image and its ability to deliver the company's vision and goals. It's, brand is very important. If the brand is high status, then the company can reap a premium from its sales because it's high status. It's a, it's a well-known brand. It's well-established. It's high status. A strong brand communicates a positive customer reputation and perception of the product or service. If it's a strong brand, if it's, if it's a well-known brand, it means it only got to be a well-known brand because customers in the past liked it. They liked the product. They, they voted for it by, by purchases, purchasing uh, the product. So a strong brand means the company has a good reputation. And that means new customers can buy with confidence. 
A strong brand will encourage more innovation and help the company sustain its position within the market. Having a strong brand is good, but it does also mean that the company must not be complacent. They must look to new ways of making purchases um, that feed into their supply, uh, their, their production. Um, they must look to buying in new technology that feed, uh, feeds into their production system as well. Uh, they must look at channels of communication with the customers, new ones. They must look at modern technology. They must maintain the brand, but maintain the core identity of the brand, which is quality and reliability. Microsoft is a strong brand and has sustained uh, with market position for many years. Um, Microsoft make excellent products. Uh, they're the market leader in many of the products in which they make. Uh, they make and are responsible for the operating system on PCs all across the world, more or less, with the exception of some open source uh, operating systems, Linux and so on. But Microsoft is the dominant uh, company in uh, personal computing. And they have therefore got a strong brand but they must maintain the brand by making sure that their product is of good quality and any changes they make to the product have been well tested and is not going to let the customers down in the future because that would damage the brand. Now the experience, well, uh, customer engagement. This type of innovation focuses on the extent to which a business and its product or service engage, engages with the customer. So customer engagement means that the company is open to contact with the customers. The customers may contact the business and ask questions and uh, contact customer services and deal with issues. And particularly if, if something has gone wrong, they're able to get redress from the company and who will become involved and sort out their problems. Uh, this is focused on building an experience through creative ideas and interactions between customers and product. Of course, any contact with customers is a source of innovation, a source of ideas. The customers will contact the business and say, yes, the product was, was fine, however, it's a pity it didn't do such and such. Well, that's an idea. Um, that might be something that the company will want to adopt or look into later on. It may not be practical, it may not be technically possible, but it shouldn't be dismissed immediately, just put perhaps uh, put away until such a time that it can be delivered. So all contact is valuable. This type of innovation requires in-depth understanding of customer profiling, their aspirations, and using this information to build connections with the customer. It's important to know who the customers are, uh, what part of the, pro of the market is the product pitched, um, how sophisticated is the product, how sophisticated are the customers? Uh, where do the customers live? Are they the urbanites or are they, do they live in the country or do they live overseas? Or... So it's important to have some sort of understanding and appreciation of the customers, their backgrounds, and try to focus any future innovative development uh, on that category of customer because they may have special requirements. Disneyland's unique customer engagement revolves around uh, building dreams. Customers know and experience a magical adventure when they visit Disneyland. Uh, they have a product, they set out to give uh, an immersive experience 
in their um, uh, theme parks. So it's an immersive experience because it is entirely Disney and the Disney characters and the Disney image, the Disney brand. So uh, it's very engaging. Once the customers get there, get to the, the theme park, it is very engaging, but it is entirely uh, Disney. So this has been a long chat about uh, Dublin's 10 innovation types. We've gone across them in great detail. Um, I think having got this far, you deserve a break. So it's, it's worth just turning everything off and relaxing for a while. But it's one of those videos that if you go back over it next time, take it in parts. Just go a little through some of the sections, turn it off, make notes and leave it for a while, go back, start the next section, and make notes. Always use the slide numbers on the bottom right of the slide to guide where you've got to, so you can wind it forwards and wind it backwards and uh, pick up where you left off. But um, it's a very important model. It illustrates quite a lot of issues about innovation. So do try to come to terms with and make your own notes as you work your way through it. That's all we're going to deal with, so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching.